we begin our service with prayer. O Lord God, our merciful Father, you have sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to open the eyes of the blind. Open our eyes so that we might see and understand your word, that we might know our sins and believe and trust in you for our forgiveness and salvation. Open our hearts also so that we might worship and praise you with our whole hearts every hour of our lives. We come before you with humble hearts seeking your grace. We ask that you would hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. This morning we will be following the order of service on page 12 and following in the worship supplement. Our meditation for this weekend is on the fourth commandment. It emphasizes God's ordained authority which he gives to human institutions here on earth for the good of society. And this too is a gift that God gives to us that he might govern us through these various institutions. We pray that the Lord would bless us in our study the fourth commandment. We open our service in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserved only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. 
but trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord give us strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, have compassion on your weak children, and in our times of need or distress, mercifully come to our defense. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. first reading for this weekend is found recorded for us in Genesis chapter 9. This may be a somewhat unfamiliar Bible history account, and yet it deals with respect and authority for those who are in authority. In this case, we have an example of Noah and his three sons after the account of the flood. We see Noah making a mistake. He gets, he first of all, plants a vineyard and becomes drunk. But we see a difference in the way that his sons then react to his drunkenness. A one example for good and one example that is not good. We're reading from Genesis chapter 9, beginning with verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. 
And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. These verses, when you think about the fourth commandment, we often think about the relationship between parents and children, since that's the main thing that the fourth commandment actually speaks about on the surface. And this account from the Old Testament points out the importance of that relationship that God has established, a respect for those who are in authority, and then also the result of not having that respect for those who are in authority. In our gospel reading for this morning, we have a different way of viewing this as well, where the Lord Jesus points out what God desires regarding those who are in authority. And we have a bad example in this case of the Pharisees, the leaders of the religious leaders of the people at that time. We read from Matthew chapter 15. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever prophet might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. God had established the fourth commandment for children to honor and care for their parents in old age. But what the traditions of the Jews had done is that they made an exception for children as their parents got older. If they would rather give sacrifices to the Jewish leaders, they were exempted from the care of their parents. And so Jesus speaks to them in this account saying, you have undermined the very commandment of God through your tradition for your own personal benefit. So not only do we see an example of undermining God's commandment, but we see an example of even within the church here, these religious leaders were leading people away from the truths of God's word rather than to them. And Jesus very, very clearly condemns this misuse of God's word and the lack of authority that God desires. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. confess our faith in our triune God who has established all authority. We'll be using the words of the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Every word of God is pure and has been recorded for our instruction in righteousness. The word of God which we're meditating on this morning is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who tells us that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth, your fellow redeemed. Over the last few weeks, we have been meditating on the Ten Commandments. And I hope that by now you've noticed that as we reflect on the Ten Commandments, which can often be seen as harsh or which can be seen as maybe putting boundaries which we don't like around us. That every single one of the commandments that God gives, he gives for our good. And that they are there in order to protect blessings that he desires for us as human beings to have in this world that he has created, especially after the fall into sin. Today we're meditating on God's gracious gift of authority, which he passes on to different human institutions in order to bring about good order in human society. If you take a look at your bulletin, if you flip the page, we have, as we have over the last few weeks, an insert that talks a little bit about the fourth commandment. And it highlights the fact that when we think about the fourth commandment, we need to see the fourth commandment as much broader than the way that we simply learned it in catechism class, honor your father and mother. God is not just protecting the authority that he has given within the family, but there are a variety of different ways and areas where God establishes authority for the good of society. Certainly one of those is in the home with the role of fathers and mothers toward their children. But we also have God-ordained authority in the government, that God establishes governments and those who are in authority through rule in order to, again, bless the flourishing of society as a whole. Not every government is a good government. In fact, when we take a look historically, we find that there is no government that is good because it is ruled by simple human beings. We're not taking a look at government itself as being good, but rather the authority that God has given as good. God has also given authority to the church, and he has given authority through work. We're going to take a look at two examples of this in the verses of our text, although all four are listed in the bulletin. We're going to look first at the home, which is the center of all authority that God has given. And then we'll also look to the workplace, another area where Paul emphasizes here in Ephesians chapter 6. And as we take a look at this authority, which sometimes we don't like, sometimes which we rebel against, sometimes those authority figures are not good authority figures, but are using their authority or power for bad or selfish means, yet God still gives this authority to us as human beings for good order in our lives and in our society as a whole. 
We pray that the Spirit would bless our study and meditation of the fourth commandment and help us to truly treasure this gift of authority that God has given for our own good here on earth. Amen. When we take a look at the fourth commandment, it's important when we begin to understand that these areas which have influence or authority over us in our lives, ultimately that authority comes from God. And every human institution which has authority is a representative of God. So if you think about it like this, here's God, God has all authority. And yet, as we've studied over and over again, God doesn't work all the time with us directly in our human lives. When God works and he blesses us as human beings, generally he uses other human beings in order to give those blessings to us. Certainly the most foremost of all is in the home, where God uses our parents and grandparents and others within our family in order to give us the things that God desires for us to have. All human authority then is a representative of God for us. And when we have that understanding, it's helpful in keeping the fourth commandment. When we realize that those individuals that we might not like or agree with that have authority over us are actually God's representatives that they are there called by God to use the authority and power that they have out of God's love and his desire for good in our lives. So human authority, number one, comes from God. We heard that passage from Roman, Matthew chapter 28 near the end of Jesus' ministry just before he ascended in heaven, into heaven. And he said to his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We understand where all authority comes from, that God has all power or authority in heaven and on earth. But then he delegates that authority or power to various human institutions. One of those is the family. We are when we realize this, when we realize that this authority that is given to these human institutions, whether it be the president of the United States or a father or a mother, or whether it be a Sunday school teacher, no matter who that authority figure is, when we understand that those authority figures are representatives of God for our good, it should change our perspective toward them. It should help us then to obey them, to serve them, to give them love and respect, as Luther describes in his explanation of the fourth commandment. Let's start with the responsibilities. Since we understand that this authority comes from God, let's begin with the responsibility of children over and against their parents. Paul begins in verse one of our text. Children, obey. There's the first word that Luther carries out in his explanation. Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he quotes the second commandment from Exodus chapter 20. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. We only have one word that's, that's actually placed in the context of this verse regarding the relationship between children and their parents. It's the simple word, obey. Children, obey your parents. And then he quotes, honor your father and mother, that it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth. There is that word honor that Luther also takes and inserts into his explanation of the fourth article, that we should love, serve, honor, respect, obey those who are in authority over us. But I want you to notice what it is that is the motivator for obedience of parents over and against their children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Paul wants the people of Ephesus, as well as us today, to understand that 
obedience and honor to our parents, to those within the home, is given to them not because of how good they might be, but because they are representatives of the Lord. Think about our Old Testament reading from earlier in Genesis chapter 9. In the account that we heard from Noah and his children, you might have taken a look at that example and said, well, Noah didn't deserve honor or respect or obedience. He made a mistake. He was sinful. He did something that he shouldn't have done. But just because Noah failed didn't mean that his son Ham didn't still owe him the honor and the respect and the obedience that he was due simply as his father. Ham didn't show his father the respect that he should have, as we see with Japheth and Shem, covering their father's nakedness, not looking on his nakedness, but showing their father the respect that they knew that their father deserved because he was God's representative on earth. We have another example later on in our text in the workplace. In verses 5 all the way through 8, Paul gives us an example of servants and masters. And again, he says in verse 5, bond servants, those who are under the authority in the workplace of someone else. Bond servants, be obedient. There's that same word again. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Now this section is a little bit longer dealing with the respect that a boss, we might use in today's language, has for those who are an employee. He says, if you are a servant, be obedient to those who are your masters. But again, notice the motivation. Not only does he say be obedient, but later on in verse 7, he says, with goodwill doing service, serving. Honor, serve, and obey them, and give them love and respect, according to Luther's explanation, taken right from Ephesians chapter 6 here. But the motivation for serving that master, that boss, is again the fact that that boss is a representative of God. Be obedient. Why? With fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Because you are a servant, a bond servant of Christ. Do service as to the Lord. What motivates us in whatever capacity we might be in in our lives to do the things that we should do and to give the respect that those who are in authority over us deserve is the fact that we are serving the Lord by doing that. That they are God's representatives here on earth. We have responsibilities of children to their parents as they serve the Lord. And we also see the example of the responsibility of employees or servants to their masters who also are motivated to do that very thing out of love for Christ, who is their greater master. Every human authority is a representative of God. Those who have authority have that authority which comes from God. It doesn't mean that every human authority figure is going to do what God desires, that they are going to be good, that they are going to be perfect. And yet we still owe those individuals the respect that we would give to God if it were God himself standing in front of us. Now these first two parts, dealing with children and servants are the parts that we usually focus on when it comes to the fourth commandment. But I want you to notice as we go on in the verses of our text that here the Apostle Paul also points out that, that since these authority figures are representatives of God and we do owe them respect as the same respect that we would give to God, those authority figures, because they represent God, 
also are required to carry out certain responsibilities toward those that they have authority over. Every human authority, not only does it get its authority from God, but it is also answerable to God in the way that it uses its authority or does not. So human authorities, whether that be in the home, whether that be in the workplace, whether that be in government, whether that be in the church, every human authority is established and given that authority in order to carry out the work that God desires. So you think about parents. Why is it that God gives parents his authority over children, the, the children that he gives to them? Because he desires to use those parents in order to bless his children. We have verse 4 of our text, God's direction then to parents, reminding them that as they use their authority, they are answerable to God for that authority or the use of it. Verse 4, Paul says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. God establishes authority and gives those authority figures power in order to, again, protect and bless society, those who are under that authority. In the home, that means that it is the responsibility of parents to carry out the will of God on behalf of their children, both not exasperating their children or provoking their children to wrath or anger, but also bringing their children up in the training or instruction of the Lord. God's desire is for children to know him and what he has done for them. And he has given that, that sole responsibility first and foremost to parents. That is their responsibility to bring their children up to know the Lord, to respect the Lord. And when parents don't do that, when they fail as Noah did in the Old Testament reading, and as we often do in our own lives, then we are answerable to God for the decisions that we've made, the mistakes that we've made, because we are representatives of God over and against our children, doing what God wants us to do out of love for not just our children, but for his children, which he has entrusted to us. The same thing is also true for servants in the workplace. We have a longer account of the duty or respect that servants owe their masters. But notice that the Lord also says that God requires something of masters to their servants. In verse 9, Paul said, And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. The Lord calls those in the workplace who have authority to a certain standard also. Not to use their position of authority for selfish gain or for their own selfish purposes, but rather out of love for those whom they have authority over. To do what is best for them. To show kindness and compassion, realizing that they too are serving Christ by using the authority that God has given to them. Whatever authority figure that might be, whether it be in the home, whether it be in government or in church or in the workplace, all of that authority is God's authority vested in human beings or institutions. And it is given for the good of society. It is God's gracious gift to govern society and to govern it for its good. Sadly, we live in a fallen world and we see all kinds of examples where authority is despised or rejected on one side, or where authority is abused on the other. But just because we live in a fallen world and we see misuses and a lack of respect for authority on both sides doesn't mean that we shouldn't do what the Lord calls us to do wherever we might be either respecting those who are in authority or using the authority that God has given to us out of love for those whom we have authority over. God has established the fourth commandment because of his great love for us, because he desires for us to flourish 
as best as we are able, even in this fallen world. And so he establishes his authority, given to various individuals and institutions, that we might recognize the authority that he has for us, and how he has used his authority for the greatest purpose of all. Yes, Jesus did have all authority in heaven and on earth. And in Jesus, we see the perfect example of that as he uses his authority and power in order to accomplish the salvation of mankind. It is that Savior who has so selflessly served us using his authority that we then look up to in every aspect of our lives, realizing that wherever we might be, in whatever calling we might have, we have the privilege and honor of serving Christ, of representing Christ in our lives, of being used by Him for the good of those who are around us. We thank our Savior that He not only has redeemed us from sin and death, but that He has also established authority for the good of society, for the good of each one of us, that we might also flourish in our lives, that we might freely and eagerly proclaim his salvation to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. next hymn, we emphasize God's gift of authority in the home. And then in our final hymn, we'll also take a look at God's gift of authority in connection with the nation or the government. We sing hymn 629.
rise for prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you that you have called us to a living faith in Jesus Christ, your Son. For by him you have given the light of your truth to all of those who are in darkness, so that we might have life through his name. Hear our prayer that your people might be lights in this world of darkness. Grant that we might be united in Christian love and zeal to do the work which you have set before us. Make us zealous in the purpose of our calling, loyal in every test of faithlessness, joyful in our promised hope, steadfast in every trial, compassionate toward all people, generous and with minds centered on all that is good. Since you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, let our words and actions show forth the praises of our Lord Jesus. Give a special measure of your grace to our homes in the same way that our Lord blessed the marriage feast at Cana with his presence. Grant that he might be the heavenly guest in every home, the guardian of its faith and of its life. Give stability and peace to the nations of the world. Of your goodness, deliver all people from famine, disease, fire, flood, storm, earthquake, or every peril according to your will. We also ask that you would send forth ministers and missionaries of your words so that people all over the world might learn of your great love and the gift of your Son and his gospel of forgiveness, grace, mercy, and eternal life. Oh Lord, we ask in particular for those who may be in any need of either body or soul. Show yourself to them as the deliverer from all evil. Give them joy for mourning, praise for heaviness of heart, the song of victory for defeat. Save each one of us from those hidden dangers which surround us according to your gracious will. Defend us both now and always even until that hour when you will finally call us away from this earthly life to the blessed life which is yet to come in heaven. In the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, we ask this, and in his precious name we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated.